Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Gordoria. Today we're going to be talking about a drug-free solution to migraine headaches. I'm a board-certified chiropractic neurologist here in Huntington, New York, and I've been working with chronic migraine patients for about 25 years. If you're watching this, you or a loved one have been suffering with migraine headaches probably for a long time. You've seen your doctor, probably a neurologist. You've had an MRI, probably an MRA, an EKG, maybe an echocardiogram. Um, you know, all of these different things like EEGs and, and MRIs and all these different tests are probably normal. You were then prescribed anti-inflammatory medications, steroids, probably tryptan medications, anti-seizure meds like Topamax. You may be getting up to 30 Botox injections in your scalp, um, maybe CGRP inhibitors, and maybe even pain management, anti-anxiety medications, antidepressant medications. But unfortunately, you probably still have the migraines. Based on my experience, you want to know two things. Can you help me and what makes you different? So here are some eye-opening facts. Migraine is not just a headache. It's also not a disease. It's actually a symptom that happens as a result of changes in the brain stem and the hypothalamus when they just function abnormally. It's a misfiring of the brain and it causes changes in the way the vascular system works. It's not a primary vascular problem, meaning it's not primarily a blood vessel problem. It's a neurological problem that causes changes in the way the blood vessels work. This all stems from brain stem dysfunction. Here are some more eye-opening facts. When this altered function takes place for a period of time, then the pain syndrome begins. Pain is not the issue. Pain is the, the last thing that comes on, and pain is the symptom. What we really have is like a brain attack that's going on that causes a whole series of neurological changes that then lead to the pain. So seeing a neurologist is usually frustrating because they usually order these tests. 90 plus percent of the time, they're all normal. And then you start this merry-go-round of medications, and nobody's even trying to find the cause at that point. So really, the only question that matters to me is what's causing your brain to misfire? Because if I can't figure that out, then I really can't help you. So there are four pillars of migraine. We can look at neurological causes, musculoskeletal causes, metabolic causes, and nutritional causes. But what we know for a fact, in, in, according to the literature, is that almost everybody that has pure migraine headache, unilateral pain behind the eye, those types of headaches, usually there's a genetic predisposition. But just because you have it in running in your family doesn't mean you're going to get it. Your genes are not your destiny. So you're not doomed, all right? There's a reason why, even though you have this genetic predisposition, that this migraine syndrome began. So let's look at some nutritional causes. We know that food sensitivities are a very powerful driver of migraine headaches. So we know about gluten, dairy, and eggs and sugar. These are very common out, like sensitivities that people have. They're not allergies. Allergies are called IgE sensitivities, whereas sensi these food intolerances are called IgG sensitivities, different part of the immune system. But we also know that amino acid deficiencies and vitamin mineral insufficiencies are very, very common with people with migraine. And we need to test for that. The neurological causes are brainstem dysfunction, area of the brain, lower, um, lower part of the brain that actually connects your brain to your spinal cord. We know that head trauma or even mild concussion can actually initiate migraine headaches down the road. Even, you wouldn't even know that it was related because it could be you know, months to years later. Neuroinflammation, which is an inflama inflammatory process that happens in the body and then goes to the brain. Changes in circadian rhythms, which are like the brain's pacemaker for day-night cycles. So when you have a sleep issue, it changes, you know, sleep issues can be a cause and or effect of circadian rhythm changes. And we have, this is that as a result, commonly due to overexposure to blue light, like being on computers all day or looking at your phone or, you know, looking at TikTok videos late at night, it overstimulates the brain and it changes the way the neurological um, system works. Your brain has two pacemakers. You know, one of them is this circadian rhythm. The other one actually comes from movement. Also, eye movement problems, and we can tell, and I'm going to go on uh, you know, and speak, speak to that in a few more slides, but we know that changes in the brainstem initiate eye movement problems, and I've never, ever once seen a patient that has migraine that doesn't have an eye movement problem. Metabolic causes. I mean, here's, here's just a, a simple view of the metabolism. You know, here's some metabolic pathways. It's so unbelievably intricate. Everything affects everything. So we know one of the major, major issues that people have are GI problems, gastrointestinal. 
So you can have stomach upset, reflux, constipation, diarrhea, mixed IBS, bloating, all of these different things all are dysfunctions in the gut. And we know that there's a very powerful gut brain connection and we need to evaluate it. Toxicity, exposure to toxins, very common. Hormonal changes. We know that people com commonly, you know, women complain about, um, you know, increased incidence of migraine around their menstrual cycle. Something called the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This is altered as a result of chronic stress. So this is how stress initiates migraine. Um, infection, chronic infections can cause it, and mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are the, like the little batteries in each cell that um, generate energy, basically, from food and from light um, and from different nutrients in the body to be able to generate ATP, which is the body's energy production source. So here's a little, a little flow chart. Things on the left cause things on the right. So non-native EMF, like being exposed to computers and, and you know, all these different like indoor lights and TV and all these different things, they're called electromagnetic frequencies. They're not native, they're not the sun. MTHFR, which is a commonly mutated gene in our body. 50% um, of us have this uh, alteration, we call it a SNP. It's also associated with migraine. Mitochondrial dysfunction I spoke about, alcohol use, poor diet, gastro issues, obesity, elevated blood sugar. So people sometimes have a, a misconception that you know, they have prediabetes and it's not so bad, but we know that you know, elevated blood sugar causes chronic inflammation. All of the things in this black box on the left cause inflammation and inflammation causes everything else. Inflammation of the body causes inflammation of the brain. Head trauma up here, concussion causes brain inflammation, which causes body inflammation. Or sleep, oxidative stress, changes in the gut. All of these different things create migraine, insomnia, anxiety, depression, fatigue, and brain fog, which are the common symptoms associated with the migraine sy uh, syndrome. Low sun exposure, no exercise, poor nutrient status, infections, toxins. Low resilience to stress, people who are you know, under stressful conditions all the time, and something called a high ACE score, which is adverse childhood events. People who are exposed to um, emotional trauma as a child have increased incidence of, of these chronic illnesses. Um, we also know that post-traumatic stress um, can actually initiate inflammation as well. These numbers associated here are the numbers of hits that you get if you were to Google migraine and inflammation. So you get 32.4 million hits in less than a second, just showing a powerful connection between inflammation and migraine. So if you're inflamed, it doesn't matter how many pills you take, nothing's gonna make that change unless we change your lifestyle, unless we look at why you have the inflammation. You know, triptans and all those meds, they're only looking to try to stamp out the pain and not looking to treat the cause. Musculoskeletal causes, like changes in your neck, the way your neck moves. You have seven vertebrae in your cervical spine in your neck, and each of them is connected by these joints that hold the bones together. Those joints are powerfully innervated or, or filled with nerve endings that drive information to your brain. Changes in the way the, the, the cervical spine works, changes integration of neurological function, and we know that that can initiate migraine headaches. So previous injury, arthritis, subluxation in the neck. EMJ dysfunction, changes in the, the joint that holds your jaw together. People commonly complain of, of jaw pain that have migraine headaches and a past whiplash injury that can initiate all these different things. There's something called vestibular migraines where people present with um, changes in their balance system and how they feel like relative to the ground. Sometimes they feel imbalanced, off balance. Uh, they feel like, you know, they're walking kind of leaning to one side. Uh, they get some headaches, but not always. You don't even have to have real intense head pain in order to be, you know, um, diagnosed with vestibular migraine, but we know that the vestibular system, the balance system, which is housed in your inner ear and in your brainstem, has a big, big role in what's going on with the uh, migraine syndrome. I, again, between the eye movements and the balance system, I've never seen a migraine patient that didn't have changes in these two areas. And we need to evaluate that. That's what a functional neurologist does. So it's time to um, you know, to try and approach that attacks the cause of the migraines and not just looking to treat the symptoms. So what makes functional neurology different? So as a functional neurologist, what I look for is how can we look at how the brain is working versus whether it's broken or not? Um, An MRI shows the structure of the brain, but almost always, you know, people have a normal looking brain. It tells us nothing about migraine. 
um, you know, unless you've had, you know, unless obviously you can have a tumor or you can have, um, you know, post uh, head trauma, you might have, you know, direct injury to the cortex, the cerebral cortex. But usually people with chronic migraine do not have those things. So we need to look at how is the brain working and we need to do specific tests to evaluate all four of those pillars because we don't know which ones are involved with you. So let's look at some testing. One of the, one of the biggest, most basic things that we need to evaluate is the gastrointestinal system. And we do that through stool testing. So we can look, take a, you know, a sample of stool and we can look at your digestive system, how you're absorbing nutrients. What kind of metabolic markers do you have? These short chain fatty acids, do you have inflammation in your gut? But also we look at this thing called the microbiome, which is the healthy bacteria and additional or even unhealthy bacteria that might be growing in your gut. We know that there's a powerful gut brain connection, something that we, we know exists for a long, long time, but now we've been able to map it and understand that the gastrointestinal system has more neurons or nerve cells than the entire brain, uh, the, the entire spinal cord. So we have to evaluate carefully what's going on with the gut because it plays a huge role in what's going on in the brain. We now are, are relating Parkinsonism to gastrointestinal, chronic gastrointestinal distress. So if we don't look at stool testing, we don't know how your gut is working. You can have an endoscopy and colonoscopy. And again, structurally, you look fine. There's nothing there. But looking at the microbiome is telling a very different story. Here's more you know, uh, additional you know, testing that we look at through stool. So you can see here's additional or dysbiotic or overgrown bacteria. Look at, look at what's going on with this patient. Massive, massive overgrowth of unhealthy bacteria. Even autoimmune triggering bacteria. Which, you know, we, which can initiate changes in the immune system function and actually an overgrowth of yeast at the bottom. So we have to test for inflammation. We have to look at ESR and C-reactive protein levels because almost all of these people have chronic inflammatory issues. So we have to do you know, neurological treatment. So instead of it being a pill or a shot, what I'm looking to do is actually rehabilitate the brain and force it to work normally again. And we do that through specific neurological exercises based on the tests that we do. So here's the powerful vestibular connection. This is the side view of the brain. And here is down here at the bottom, this section here in white is called the brain stem. Down here at the bottom bottom is where the spinal cord meets. So this whole thing is encased in your skull. This area in here called the pons, and you have this upper, upper level is called the mesencephalon. This down, lower level is called the medulla. These areas contain the nerves that control your balance system, which is called a vestibular system. And those powerfully drive, you can see cerebral blood vessels. So the changes in the blood vessel diameter that we usually attribute to migraine headaches are really controlled by vestibular neurons. Here we go, vestibular effects on cerebral blood flow. Just wanna show you the literature and you know, understanding that we have changes directly affecting cerebral blood flow when we have alterations in the vestibular apparatus. So we do specific tests in the office to look at these things, balance testing, different head positions and looking at how that relates to the balance system. And then I'll show you other tests that we do to look at eye movements. This is a paper that came out that literally outlines all of this uh, migraine pathophysiology by Goadsby. Um, and again, mapping out the connections between brainstem dysfunction, blood vessel diameter, and alterations in the way the entire system works. This is a test that we do in the office, and we look at and talk, we look at specific eye movements, and we have a system that actually videos your eye movements. So here is normal, quick movements between two points. These are so-called saccades. And you can see almost perfect, bang, 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 back and forth between two points, very clean. This is a patient on the left with migraine. Their eyes are not moving in a coordinated fashion and they're all over the place. Eye movements to tell us changes in the brainstem are happening and then brainstem related migraine headaches can be remediated, we can fix that. Same test except looking at the horizontal or back and forth from a side view, we could go, you know, the, basically the patient is, is looking at a screen and going back and forth following um, you know, an object on a screen. And we're ca capturing that with video. And you can see their eyes are moving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and relatively straight line. Over here on the left, what we can see is the patient's trying to do the same thing, except their eyes are not able to do that because their brainstem is dysfunctioning. So imagine if your eyes are moving a million times a day 
and chronically abnormal, then the feedback that your eyes are giving to the brain is that there's a problem in the brainstem. And what comes first, the brainstem issue causing the eye movements, or sometimes the eye movements causing the brainstem dysfunction. Either way, we need to remediate these. We need to train your eyes to work better. This is a test where we look at something called gaze stability or eye stability, where you're, you're staring at an object and we're capturing literally thousands of points within um, you know, probably a 21 second period. And we're able to capture the, that the eyes are locked on to a specific point in time. And we're looking at the gaze ability or gaze stability of the eyes. You can see over here on the left, this patient with migraine has no gaze stability. So the stabilization of the eyes on a target are horrible. These are slow movement called pursuits, horizontal pursuits, where the, the patient is tracking an object going back and forth. And you can see here on the right, very smooth tracking. Everything looks good. Look at this left side and you can see this is what a patient with migraine looks like. Again, not every patient has pure neurological dysfunction that's horrible like this, but or even small alterations in, in saccades and pursuits or, or gaze stabilization can cause profound changes in the brainstem and overall brain function. Again, this is slow movement up and down. Here's normal on the right, and here's abnormal on the left migraine patient. This is a balance assessment where we can look at, um, we put you on um, like a foam pad, and we can evaluate for uh, computerized testing to look at, you know, are you able to stay in a, in a, within a certain ellipse that, you know, tells us about normal uh, balance training. And this, again, comes from the brain stem. So here are some questions. How have your migraines affected your relationships, family, finances, or other activities? And are you enjoying your life to the fullest? I can tell you if you have chronic migraines, the answer is no. Because how could you be when you're, when you're feeling so bad so much of the time? Um, you know, chronic migraineers have, you know, 15 or more migraines a month or 15 days lost. I mean, that's half a month every month. How much of your migraines cost you in time, money, happiness, and sleep? Where do you picture yourself in the next three to five years if the cause of your migraines is not corrected? You know, are you ready to try something totally different to attack the potential cause or causes of your migraines? You know, the bottom line is that you don't need a pill or a shot. You need a program to fix your body and your brain. And that's exactly what we do. Functional neurological care is a program where we actually rehabilitate your body and your brain. And when we take away what's hurting you and we give you what you're missing, your body works normally again. And we turn these patients around all the time. Comprehensive neurological testing in office, very, very straightforward, functional neurological and standard neurological testing. And it tells us the story. So again, my name is Dr. Michael Grudadoria. I am a board certified functional neurologist, and I'm also on the advisory board at Functional Medicine University. I'm also the founder of the uh, Functional Medicine Alliance for a national nonprofit on mental health called Same Here Global. I've been working with patients for more than 25 years. And if you're ready to make a change, give us a call, 516-231-4402.